Book 9. Enemy at the Gates. Now, while off in the distance much was underway, Saturnian Juno hurried Iris down from the sky to Turnus, brash in arms, seated then by chance in a hollowed glen, his forebear Pilumnus's grove. The messenger with her rosy lips bestirred the king. Turnus, what no god would dare to promise you, the answer to your prayers? Time in its rounds has brought you all unasked. Yes, Aeneas has quit his camp, his comrades and his fleet. He's lighted out for the Palantine Hill, Evander's royal home. But still not satisfied, he's made his way to the farthest towns of Corythus, arming a band of Tuscans, country folk he's mustered. Why hold back? Now is the time for horse and chariot. Away with delay. Attack their shattered camp. She towered into the sky on balanced wings, cleaving a giant rainbow, flying beneath the clouds. And Turnus knew her and raised both hands to the stars, calling after the goddess, trailing her flight with cries. Iris, pride of the sky, who has sped you here to me, swooping down from the clouds to reach the, the earth? Why, this sudden radiance lighting the heavens? I can see the clouds parting, the stars riding, the arching skies. I follow a sign so clear, whoever you are, who calls me into action. In that spirit he, went, spirit, he went to the river's edge, drew pure water from the brimming banks, and prayed to the gods over and over, weighing down the heaven with his vows. And next, his entire army was moving out across the plain, rich in cavalry, rich in braided cloaks, bright gold. Mesippus heads the column, the rear is brought up by the sons of Tyrus. Turnus commands the center, a force like the Ganges, rising, fed by seven quiet streams, or the life-giving Nile, ebbing back from the plains to settle down at last in its own banks and bed. Suddenly, far off, a massive dust cloud rises, black as night, darkness sweeping across the plain. The Trojans spot it, and first from the landward wall, Caicus calls out, What's that mass, my countrymen? Blackness rolling towards us? Quick, take arms, pass out weapons, mount the walls. The enemy's all but on us. Battle stations. With a deafening roar, the Trojans all come pouring in through the gates for shelter. Mount the ramparts now. So ran his parting orders, Aeneas, best of captains. If any crisis comes while I'm away, don't risk a pitched battle. No, don't trust to the open field. Just guard the camp and ramparts, safe behind the walls. So, through shame and anger, though shame and anger spur them to all-out war, still they bar the gates, they follow the orders, armed to the hilt, protected inside the turrets, bracing for the foe. But Turnus, flying on ahead of his slower column, flanked by a picked troop of twenty horsemen, gains the town in no time, borne by a Thracian charger blazed with white and helmed in his golden cask with crimson crest. Who's with me, men? Who's first to attack the enemy? Just watch, he cries and hurls his javelin into the sky, the opening shot of war, and high in his saddle races down the plain as his shouting comrades speed him on, riding in his wake with their war cries, striking terror, amazed at the Trojans' bloodless hearts, and calling, No trusting themselves to a level field of battle, no braving our infantry, grappling hand to hand. The cowards cling to camp. Wildly, back and forth, Turnus gallops along the walls. A way in? No way in. As a wolf prowling in wait around some crowded sheepfold, bearing the wind and rain in the dead of night, howls at chinks in the fence, and the lambs keep bleeding on, snug beneath their dams. The wolf rages, desperate. How can he maul a quarry out of reach? Exhausted, frenzied with building hunger, starved so long, his jaws parched for blood. So wildly Turnus, scanning the camp and rampart, flares in anger. Brute resentment sears him to the bone. What tactic to try, to make a breakthrough? How to shake those pinned-up Trojans clear of their walls and strew them down the plain? The armada, there, hard by the camp it lay tied up, riding at anchor shielded round by the high redoubts and river currents. Here he attacks, shouting out to his cheering comrades, Bring up fire! A man on fire. 
he seizes a blazing pine tar torch in his fist. And now, watch, his men pitch into the work as Turnus urges them on in person, and whole battalions equip themselves with smoking brands. They've plundered the hearth fires, sooty torches ignite a murky glare, and the god of fire hurls at the sky a swirl of sparks and ashes. What god, you muses, warded off such savage flames from the Trojans? Who drove from the ships such raging fire? Tell me. Trust in the tale is old, yet its fame will never die. In the early days on Phrygian Ida's slopes, when Aeneas first built his fleet, gearing up for the high seas, they say the Baristhian, mother of gods herself, appealed to powerful Jove with pleading words. Grant this prayer, my son, that your loving mother makes to you, since now you rule on Olympus's heights. I had a grove on the mountain's crest where men would bring me gifts, a pine wood loved for long, dark with pitch pine, shady with maple timber. These woods I gladly gave the Dardan prince when the prince lacked a fleet. Now dread and anguish have me in their grip. Dissolve my fears. Let a mother's prayers prevail. May these galleys never be wrecked, or any passage out, or overpowered by whirling storms at sea. Let their birth on our mountains be a blessing. Her son, who makes the starry world go round, replied, Mother, what are you asking fate to grant? What privilege are you begging for your ships? Think, should keels laid by a mortal hand enjoy an immortal's rights? Should Aeneas go through scathing dangers all unscathed? Aeneas? What god commands such power? Nevertheless, one day, when their tour of duty is done at last, and they moor in a western haven, all the ships that survived the waves and bore the Trojan prince to Latium's fields, I will strip them of mortal shape and command them all to be goddesses of the deep, like Dodo, Nereus's daughter, and Gal Galatea too, breasting high, cleaving the frothing waves. Jove had spoken. Sealing his pledge by the sticks, his brother's rapids, his brother's stream, by the banks that churn with pitch black rapids, whirlpools swirling dark, he nodded his assent, and his nod made all of Mount Olympus quake. And so the promised day had arrived, and the fates filled out the, ass the assigned time when Turnus's rampage warned the mother to drive his brands from her consecrated ships. And first a strange radiance flashed in all eyes, and a great cloud appearing out of the dawn came sweeping down the sky, trailed by the goddess's dancing troops from Ida. Then an awesome voice descended through the air, surrounding the Trojan and Rutulian ranks alike. No frantic rush to defend my ships, you Trojan. No rising up in arms. Turnus can sooner burn the ocean dry than burn these sacred pines of mine. Run free, my ships. Run, you nymphs of the sea. Your mother commands you now. And all at once, each vessel, snapping her cables free of the bank, they dive like dolphins, plunging headlong beaks to the bottom's depth. Then up they surface, turning into lovely virgins, wondrous omen, each a sea nymph sweeping out to sea. The Rutulians shrank in panic. Messapus himself was stunned with, his, with terror. His stallions reared, and the river, roaring, checked its current. Tiber summoned his outflow back from open ocean. But dauntless Turnus never loses faith in his daring. He flares up more at his men, inflaming their spirits more. All these omens threaten the Trojans. Jove himself has whisked away their trusted line of defense. No waiting for us, for Rutulian sword and torch to strike their ships. So now the open sea is blocked to the Trojans. No escape, no hope. They're robbed of half the world, and the other half, dry land, is in our grasp. So many thousand Italians take up arms. All their fateful oracles, words from the gods these Phrygians bandy about, alarm me not at all. Let it be quite enough for fate and Venus both that Trojans reach the rich green land of Italy. Trojans! I have my own fate, too, counter to theirs, to stamp out these accursed people with my sword. They've stolen away my bride. Atreus's sons... They're not alone in suffering such a wound. Not only Mycenae has a right to go to war. To die once is enough. 
the crime they committed once should be enough. If only they hated most all womankind so deeply. These Trojans would bar who borrow courage, build their trust on the walls they raise, the ditch they dig between us. What a flimsy buffer to shield them from all slaughter. Haven't they seen Troy's ramparts, built by Neptune's hands, collapse in flames? But you, my elite ones, who is ready to hack their ramparts down with the sword, to join me now and storm their panicked camp? I have no use for all the armor Vulcan forged, nor for a thousand ships to go against these Trojans. Let all the Etruscans join them at once as allies. They need not fear our stealing up on them in the dark like skulking cowards to rob them of their palladium, butcher their sentries posted on the heights. No hiding ourselves away in a horse's blind dark flanks. In naked daylight, I am determined now to ring their walls with fire. I'll make certain they never think they're fighting Greek and Pelasgian boys, the recruits that Hector warded off ten years. But now, my comrades, seeing the best part of the day is done, for the rest, refresh yourselves, hearts high. You've done good work, and trust to it now. We're headed for battle. All the while, Mesopus is ordered to cordon off the gates with the sentry line and gird the walls with fire. Fourteen Vertulians are picked to guard the ramparts, each commanding a hundred troops, their helmets crested with purple plumes, their war gear glinting gold. They scatter to posts and man the watch by turns, or stretching out on the grass, enjoy their wine, tilting their bronze bowls while the fires burn on and the watchmen dice away a sleepless night. Scanning all of this from the walls aloft, the Trojans hold the heights with men at arms, while edgy, anxious, they reinforce the gates, building bulwarks, joining ramps to the outworks, bringing weapons up. Menestheus, fierce Serestus, are spurring on the work. The men whom Captain Aeneas charged, should Chrysus call, to marshal troops and ranks and take command of the outpost. The whole army's on guard, tents along the walls. With perilous posts assigned, they stand watch by turns, each fighter defending what he must defend. Now Nisus guarded a gate, matchless in battle. Her... <laughs> Hyrtacus's son, Aeneas' comrade. Ida the huntress sent him, quick as the wind with spears and winging arrows, and right beside him came his friend, Euryalus. None more winning among Aeneas' soldiers, none who strapped on Trojan armor, a young boy sporting the first dawn of manhood, cheeks unshaved. One love bound them, Side by side, they'd rush to attack. So now, standing the same watch, they held one gate. Euryalus, Nisus asks, do the gods light this fire in our hearts, or does each man's mad desire become his god? For a while now, a cravings urged me on to swing into action, some great exploit, no peace and quiet for me. See those Rutulians? What trust they put in their own blind luck. Watch fires flickering far apart, men sprawling, sunk in their wine and sleep, dead silence all around. Now listen to what I'm mulling over. What new plan is shaping in my mind? The people, the elders, all demand that Aeneas be recalled, and men dispatched to tell him how the land lies. If they promise you my reward, the fame of the work's enough for me. I think I can just make out a path, under that hill, to Palentium city walls. Euryalus froze, his heart pounding with love of praise, and he checks his fiery friend at once. So, Nisus, grudging your friend a share in your fine exploit? I'm to send you out alone into so much danger? That's not how father, the old soldier, Opheltes, brought me up in the thick of the Greek terror, the death throes at Troy. Nor has it been my way, soldiering on beside you, following out the fate of great-hearted Aeneas, right to the bitter end. Here's a heart that spurns the light, that counts the honor you're after cheap at the price of life. No, Nisus insisted. I have no such qualm about you. How wrong I'd be. Just like great Jove or whatever god looks down with friendly eyes on what we do, carry me back to you in triumph. Ah, but if... And, and you often see such things in risky straits. If anything sends me down to death, some god, some twist of fate, you must live on, I say. You're young. Your life's worth more than mine. Let someone commit my body to the earth, snatched from battle or ransomed back for gold. Or if fortune, 
up to her old tricks, denies me rights, pay them when I am gone, and honor me with a hollow tomb. Nor would I cause your mother so much grief, dear boy. She alone, out of so many Trojan mothers, dared to follow you all the way. She had no love for great Acestes' city. Euryalus countered, You're spinning empty arguments. They won't work. No, my mind won't change. Won't budge an inch. Let's be gone. With that, he stirs the sentries, and up they march to take their turn on watch. Leaving his post, he and his comrade, Nisus, strive off to find the prince. Across the earth, all other creatures were stretched out in sleep, easing their cares, their spirits blank to hardship. But the leading Trojan chiefs, the chosen men of rank, were holding a council now on grave affairs of state. What should they do? Who will take word to Aeneas? There they stand, out on the open campgrounds, leaning on spears, hands at rest on shields, when in rush Nisus and Euryalus side by side, clamoring for admittance, being heard at once. We've something urgent, well worth your while. So intense that Ulysses with Ulysses was both first to welcome both, inviting Hyrtacus' son to speak, and so he did. Men of Aeneas, hear us out with open minds. Don't judge what we say by our young ears. The enemy's sunken deep in sleep and wine, dead to our world. There's a place for mischief. We've seen it ourselves, an open fork in the road, at the gate that fronts the coast. It's dark there, gaps in their watch fires, smoke blackens the sky. Give us this chance to make our way to Aeneas, Palentium too, and you'll soon see us back, loaded with spoils, some bloody killing done. The road won't play us false. Hunting the dark glens, day after day, we've scouted the city's outposts, reconnoitered every bend in the river. Aledes, bowed with years, a seasoned advisor, cried out, Gods of our fathers, Troy's eternal shield. So you're not about to destroy us root and branch, not if you plant such courage, such resolve in our young soldiers' hearts. He grasped them both by the hands and hugged their shoulders, tears rivering down his cheeks. For you, good men, what reward can I find to equal the noble work you're set on? First and best the gods will give, and your own sense of worth. The rest a thankful Aeneas will repay at once, and young Ascanius too. As long as he lives, he'll never forget such meritorious service. Never, Ascanius steps in. My life depends on father's safe return. By our great household gods, by Aceracus' hearth god and white-haired Vesta's shrine, I swear to you both. Nisus, all my hope, my fortune lies in your laps alone. Just call father back. Bring him back to my eyes. If he returns, all griefs are gone. Two cups I'll give you, struck in silver, ridged with engraving. Father took them both when Arisba fell, and a pair of tripods, two large bars of gold, and a wine bowl full of years, Dido of Sidon's gift. But if, in fact, we capture Italy, seize the scepter in triumph, allot the plunder, you've seen the stallion Turnus rides, the armor he sports, all gold, that mount... The shield, the blood-red plumes, I exempt from the lot. Your trophy's nicest now. Also, father will give twelve women, beauties all, and a dozen captive soldiers, each in armor, more, whatever lands the, their king Latinus claims for himself. But you, Euryalus, who you who outstrip me by a year, I admire you. I receive you with all my heart. Through thick and thin embrace you as my comrade. Never without you, when I am bent on glory, whether in word or action, peace or war, you have my trust forever. Euryalus replied, No day will show me unequal to such brave work, if only the dice of fortune fall out well, not badly. But topping all your gifts, I beg you, just one more. My mother, of Priam's ancient stock, poor woman, neither the land of Troy could hold her back, setting sail with me, nor King Acestes' city. Now I leave her, unaware of the risk I run, whatever it is, with no parting words, because I swear by the night and your right hand I cannot bear the sight of my mother's tears. But you, I beg you, comfort her in her frailty, <clears throat> brace her in desolation. Let me carry this hope of you, and all the bolder I go to face the worst. The Trojans were moved to tears, handsome Eulus the most of all. 
Touched by love for his own father, this image stirred his heart. Trust me, he said. All I do will be worthy of your great exploit. Your mother will be mine in all but, this, but the name, Creusa. No small thanks awaits the one who bore such a son. Whatever comes of your exploit, I swear by my life, the oath my father used to take. All I promise you on your return in glory, the same reward awaits your mother and your kin. <clears throat> he weeps as he speaks and draws from his shoulder strap a sword of gold, forged by one Lysaon of Crete. Marvelous work, fitted with ivory sheath and set for action. Menestheus hands Nisus a fine shaggy hide stripped from a lion, and trusty old Aledes exchanges helmets with him. <clears throat> now, both armed, they move out at once, and as they go, an escort of ranking Trojan, warriors young and old, sees them off at the gates with many prayers. Yet first the handsome Ulysses, beyond his years, filled with a man's courage, a man's concerns as well, gives them many messages to carry to his father. But the winds scatter them all, all useless, fling them into the clouds. Now out they go, crossing the trench and threading through the camp, heading toward the enemy camp, destined to die but make a bloodbath first. Bodies everywhere. They can see them stretched in the grasses, sunk in a drunken stupor, chariot poles tipped up on the shore. Bodies of fighters trapped in the wheels and harness. Weapons and wine cups, too, are strewn about. And Nisus speaks up first. Euryalus, now for the daring sword hand, now the moment calls. Here's the way. You keep guard at our back, so no patrol can attack us from the rear. You be on the alert. A hawk's eye all around. I'll make a slaughter. Cut you a good clean swath. Nisus breaks off as he plants his sword in lofty ram knees, propped up by chance on a pile of rugs, his chest puffed out and heaving, dead asleep, a king himself. King Turnus's favorite prophet, but no prophecy now could save him from his death. Three aides at his side the Trojan killed, off guard, sprawled in a snarl of arms, then Ramus's armor bearer, then his charioteer. He caught him under his horse's hooves. He hacks their lolling necks and lops the head of their master, leaves the trunk of him spouting blood, the earth and bedding warmed with the wet black gore. He cuts down Lemuris too. Lamus and Serranus, well-built soldier, he'd gamed away till late at night and now lay numb in a drunken haze. Lucky man, if only he'd stretched his gambling through the night and played it out till dawn. Nisus, wild as a starved lion, raging through crowded pens as the hunger drives him mad, and he mangles sheep, dumb with terror, rips to shred their shreds their tender flesh and roars from bloody jaws. No less bloody Euryalus's work, the man's on fire, storming down on the common ruck before him. Phaedus, Herbesius, Rhodus, Abarus, quite unconscious now. But Rhodus, waking, witnessed it all and cowering, crouching behind an enormous mixing bowl. But Euryalus pounced as Rhodus once, or as Rhodus rose. He rushed him, drove a sword in his heart, up to the hilt, then wrenched it back, dripping death. Rhodus vomits his red lifeblood, spewing out gore and wine mixed with the man's last gasp. But still, Euryalus glowed with the killer's stealth. He was stalking nearer Mesippus's henchmen now. He could spot the outer campfires flickering low, and horses tethered securely, grazing grass. The cavalry, when Nisus, sensing his comrades run amok with bloodlust, cuts him short. Call it quits. The dawn's at hand, our old foe. Enough revenge. We've hacked a path through enemy lines. Enough. And they leave behind a hall of soldiers' armor, struck in solid silver, mixing bowls in the bargain, gorgeous rugs. But Euryalus tears off Ramne's battle emblems and gold-studded belt, gifts that lavish Chaedicus once sent Ramulus of Tibur, hoping to seal a pact with a friend then far away. And Ramulus dying, passed them on to his grandson, and, once he died, the Latins commandeered them in battle, spoils of war. Euryalus seizes them, fits them onto his gallant shoulders, all for nothing. He dons Mesippus's helmet, crested with tossing plumes. The raiders quit the camp and race for safety. But just then, a troop of cavalry, sent on ahead from the Latin city, the rest of the army waits, poised on the plan comes riding in with messages for King Turnus. 
three hundred strong, all men bearing shields with fulkins in command. Just nearing the camp, just coming up to the earthworks when they spot at a distance, two men swerving off to the left. The helmet, Euryalus forgot, it glints in the dark. It gives him away. It's caught in a shaft of moonlight. A sight not lost on Vulcans, shouting out from the vanguard. Soldiers, halt! Why on the road, in armor? Who are you? Where are you headed? No answer given. Off they scurry into the woods and trust to night. But the troopers fan out left and right, blocking the well-known paths, the sentries ringing all ways out. The dense woods spread far. The thickets and black ilex bristle. Briars crowd the entire place, with a rare track showing a faint trace through the thick blind glades. The dark branches, the heft of the plunder, all weighs down Euryalus. Fear leads him astray in the tangled paths. But Nisus gets away, unthinkingly flees the, flow, flees the foe to a place called Alban, later named for Alba, then a spot where Latinus kept his sturdy sheepfolds. Here Nisus halts, looking back for his lost friends. No you, friend, no use. My poor Euryalus, where did I lose you? Where can I find you now? Nisus already picks his way, wheeling, groping back through the whole deceptive wood, retracing, scouring his tracks through the silent brush. He hears hoofbeats, hears a commotion, orders, hot pursuit. The next moment, a cry hits his ears, and look, Euryalus, caught by the full band, undone by the dark, the place, the treachery, sudden crashing attack, he's overwhelmed. They're dragging him off, struggling, desperate, doomed. What can Nisus do? How can he save his young friend? What force, weapons, what bold stroke? Pitch himself at the swords and die at once? Race through wounds to a swift and noble death? Quickly cocking his arm, his lance brandished high, he cranes up at the moon and prays his heart out. You, goddess Latona's daughter, stand by me now. Help me now in the thick of danger, glory of stars, guard of the groves. If Father Hyrdicus ever gave you gifts in my name to grace your altars, if I have ever adorned them with hunting trophies, hanging them from your dome, fixing them to your roofs, help me root my enemies, wing my spear through the air. With that, he hurled his spear, his whole body behind it, whirring on through the dark night. It flies at Solmo, and striking his turned back, it splits. Crack! And a splinter stabs his midriff through. He twists over, vomiting hot blood from his chest, chill with death, his flanks racked with last gasps. The Rutulians reel, looking about. But now, Nisus, all the bolder, watch, cocking another spear be beside his ear as the enemy panics, Hurls, and the shaft goes hissing right through Tagus's brow, splitting it, sticking deep in the man's warm brains. Vulcans burns with fury, stimmied. Where can he find the one who threw it? Where can he aim his rage? No matter, he cries. Now you'll pay me in full with your hot blood for both my men. With that, he rushes Euryalus, sword drawn, as Nisus, terrified, frenzied, no more hiding in the shadows, no enduring such anguish any longer, he breaks out. Me, here I am. I did it. Turn your blades on me. Rutulians, the crime's all mine. He never dared, could never do it. I swear by the skies up there, the stars, they know it all well. All he did was love his unlucky friend too well. But while he begged, the sword goes plunging clean through Euryalus' ribs, cleaving open his white chest. He writhes in death as blood flows over his shapely limbs. His neck droops, sinking over a shoulder, limp as a crimson flower cut off by a passing plow that droops as it dies, or frail as poppies, their necks weary, bending their heads when a sudden shower weighs them down. But Nisus storms the thick of them, out for Vulcans, one among all, Vulcans his lone concern, his enemies massing around him, trying to drive him back, left, right, but he keeps charging, harder, swirling his lightning sword till facing Vulcans, he sinks his blade in his screaming mouth, Nisus dying, just as he stripped the enemy of life. Then, riddled with wound on wound, he threw himself on his lifeless friend, and there, in the still of death, found peace at last.
how fortunate, both at once. If my songs have any power, the day will never dawn that wipes you from the memory of the ages. Not while the house of Aeneas stands by the capital's rock unshaken, not while the Roman father rules the world. Triumphant, the Rutulians gathered their battle plunder, weeping now as they bore the lifeless body of Vulcans back to camp. There they wept no less, finding Ramnes blood white, and so many captains killed in one great slaughter. Serenus, Numa too, and a growing crowd cluster around the dead and dying men, and the ground lies warm with the recent massacre. <laughs> Rivulets fo foam with blood. Together they recognize the trophies of war, Messapus's burnished helmet, and many emblems retrieved with so much sweat. <clears throat> By now, early dawn had risen up from the saffron bed of Tithonus, scattered fresh light on the world. <clears throat> Sunlight flooded in, and the rays laid bare the earth, as Turnus, fully armed himself, calls to his men to arms. And each commander marshals his own troops for battle, squadrons sheathed in bronze, and wets their fury with mixed accounts of the last night's slaughter. They even impale the heads on brandished spikes, the heads a grisly sight, and strut behind them, baiting them with outcries, Euryalus and Nisus. On the rampart's left wing, the river flanks the right, the hardened troops of Aeneas group in battle order, facing enemy lines and manning the broad trench, or stationed up on the towers, wrung with sorrow. Men stunned by the sight of the men of men they know too well, their heads stuck on pike staffs, dripping gore. That moment, rumor, flown through the shaken camp, wings the news to the ears of Euryalus's mother. Suddenly, warmth drains from her grief-stricken body. The shuttle's flung from her hand. The yarn unravels, and off she flies, poor thing. Shrilling a woman's cries and tearing her hair, insane, she rushes onto the high walls, seeking the front ranks posted there. Without a thought for the fighters, none for the perils, the spears know. She fills the air with wails of mourning, you, is this you I see, Euryalus? You, the only balm of my old age? How could you leave me all alone? So cruel. When you set out on that deadly mission, couldn't your mother have said some last farewell? What heartbreak. Now you lie in an unknown land, fresh game for the dogs and birds of Latium. Nor did your mo own mother lead her son's cortege, or seal your eyes in death, or bathe your wounds, or shroud you round in the festive robe I wove, speeding the work for you, laboring day and night, lightening with the loom the pains of my old age? Where can I go? What patch of ground now holds your body cut to pieces, your mutilated corpse? This head, it's all you bring me back, my son? It's all that I followed, crossing land and sea? Stab me through. If you have any decency left, whip all your lances into me, you Rutulians. Kill me first with steel, or pity me. You, great father of the gods, and whirl this hated body down to hell with a bolt, the only way I know to burst the chains of this, this brutal life. Her wails dashed their spirits. A spasm of sorrow went throbbing through them all. They were broken men, their lust for battle numbed. As she inflames their grief, Idaeus and Actor, ordered by Ilionus, Ilionius and Eulus, weeping freely, cradle her in their arms and bear her back inside. A terrific brazen blast went blaring out from the trumpets far and wide, and war cries echo the horns and the high sky resounds. And now the Volscians charge, ranks of them packing under a tortoise shell of shields, bent on filling the trenches, tearing down stockades. Some press hard for an entry, scaling the walls with ladders, wherever a gap shows in the thin defensive rings and light breaks through. The opposing Trojans fling down missiles, any and all, thrusting off the assault with rugged spikes, experts from their years of war at defending city ramparts. Great boulders they trundle down on the raiders, huge weights, trying to break their shielded troops, but under the tortoise shell they gladly take their blows. Yet they can't hold out. Wherever Rutulians mass for attack, the Trojans roll up immense rocks and heave them hurtling down, cracking their armored carapace, crush them, send them reeling, 
And now the bold Rutulians lose all zest for battle under a blind defensive shell. They struggle out in the open, flinging spears to clear the enemy ramparts. Here in another sector, Mezentius, grim sight, is shaking a Tuscan pine beam, hurling fire and smoky pitch at the foe as Mesippus, breaker of horses, Neptune's son, is ripping open a rampart, shouting, Ladders! Scale the walls! I pray you, Cali Calliope, muses, inspire me as I sing what carnage and death the sword of Turnus spread that day, what men each fighter speeded down to darkness. Come, help me unroll the massive scroll of war. Now a tower reared high, a commanding salient point with rampways climbing up to it. All the Italians fought to storm it, full strength, straining to drag it down, full force, while Trojans, jammed inside, fought to defend it, barricade it with stones, hurling salvos of spears through gaping loopholes. Turnus, first to attack, whirled a flaming torch that stuck in the tower's flanks, and whipped by the wind, it quickly seized on planking, clinging fast to the doorway's posts it ate away. Inside, panic, chaos, soldiers fighting to find some way out of the flames, no hope. Men went cramming back to the safe side, back from the killing heat, but under the sudden lurch of the weight, the tower came toppling down, making the whole wide heaven thunder back its crash. Fighters writhe in death, crushed on the ground, the enormous wreckage right on top of them, yes, impaling them on their own weapons, stabbing splintered timbers through their chests. Only Helenor and Lycus slipped to safety. Just Helenor, still in the flush of youth. A slave, Lysimnia, bore him once to Maeonia's king in secret, sent him to Troy, light-armed in forbidden gear, a naked sword, and a shield still blank, unblazoned. Now he found himself in the thick of Turnus's thousands, Latin battalions crowding, pressing at all points, as a wild beast snared in a closing ring of hunters, raging against their weapons, flings itself at death, staring doom in the face. Leaping straight at the spears, just so wild, the young soldier leaps at the enemy's center, rushing at death where he sees the spearhead's densest. But Lycus, far faster, escapes through enemy lines and spears to reach the wall, clawing up to the coping, trying to grasp his comrade's hand, when Turnus, chasing him down with the lance, shouts in triumph, Fool! You hope to escape my clutches? Seizing him as he dangles, tearing the man down along with the hefty piece of wall, as the eagle that bears Jove's lightning snatches up in his hooking talons a hare or snow-white swan and towers into the sky or the wolf of Mars that rips a lamb from the pins, and its mother, desperate to find it, fills the air with bleeding. War cries rising everywhere. On and on they charge, packing the trench with earth, some men hurling fiery torches onto the rooftops. Ilionis, heaving a rock, a huge crag of a rock, brings down Luc Lucetius, just assaulting the gates with a flaming torch in hand as Liger kills a Matheon, Asilus lies out Corineus, one adept with javelin, one with arrows blindsiding in from a distance. Canus kills Ortigius, Turnus triumphant Canus, Turnus cuts down Idas, Clonius, Deoxippus, and Promulus, Sagarus, Idas, posted out in front of the steepest towers, and Capus kills Pervernus. The Melissa's spear grazed him first. He dropped his shield. The idiot raised his hand to the gash as the arrow flew, and digging deep in his left side, deeper, burst the ducts of his life breath with a deadly wound. There stood Arkin's son, decked out in brilliant gear, and a war shirt stitched blood red with Spanish dye, a fine, striking boy. His father reared him once in the Grove of Mars, where Samathus's waters swirl, and a shrine to the gods of Sicily stand, the Palachi, quick to forgive, their altar rich with gifts, and he sent his son to war. Mezentius's hissing sling, keeping its strap taut and dropping his spears, three times he whipped it around his head, let fly, and the lead shot, sizzling hot in flight, split his enemy's skull and splayed him out head first on a bank of sand. Then, they say, Ascania shot for the first time in war, 
the flaring arrow he'd saved till now for wild game, routing, terrorizing them. Now his bow hand cut down strong Numenus, Ramulus by family name, just lately bound in marriage to Turnus's younger sister. Numenus, out of the front lines he swaggered, chest puffed up with his newfound royal rank, and he let loose an indiscriminate string of ugly insults, flaunting his own power to high heaven. What? Have you no shame, you Phrygians twice enslaved, pinned up twice over inside blockaded ramparts, skulking away from death behind your walls? Look at the heroes who'd seize our brides in battle. What god drove you to Italy? What insanity? No sons of Atreus here, no spinner of tales, Ulysses. We're rugged stock. From the start, we take our young ones down to the river and toughen them in the bitter icy streams. Our boys, they're up all night, hunting, scouring the woods. Their sport is breaking horses, whipping shafts from bows. Our young men, calloused by labor, used to iron rations, tame the earth with maddocks or shatter towns with war. All our lives are honed to the hard edge of steel. Reversing our spears, we spur our oxen's flanks. No lame old age can cripple our high spirits, sap our vigor, no. We tamp our helmets down on our gray heads, and our great joy is always to haul fresh booty home and live off all we seize. But you, with your saffron-braided dress, your flashy purple, you live for lazing, lost in your dancing, your delights, blowsy sleeves on your war shirts, ribbons on bonnets, Phrygian women, that's what you are, not Phrygian men. Go traipsing over the ridge of Dindima. Catch the songs on the double pipe you dote on so. The tambourines, they're calling for you now, and the boxwood flutes of your Berecynthian mother perched on Ida. Leave the fighting to men. Lay down your swords. Flinging his slander, ranting taunts, Ascanius had enough. Facing him down and aiming a shaft from his bowstring, horse gut, tense, he stood there, stretching both arms wide, praying first to Jove with a fervent heartfelt vow. Jove Almighty, not assent to the daring work I have in hand. All on my own, I'll bring your temple yearly gifts. I'll steady before your altar a bull with gilded brows, bright white with its head held high as its mother's, butting its horns already, young hoofs kicking sand. And the father heard and thundered on the left from a cloudless sky. The instant the lethal bow sings out and the ta taut shaft flies through Ramulus' head with a vicious hiss, and renders his empty temples with its steel. Go on now, mock our courage with high and mighty talk. Here's the reply the Phrygians, twice enslaved, return to you, Rutulians. That's all he says. The Trojans echo back with a roar of joy, their spirits sky high. By chance Apollo, god of the flowing hair, enthroned on a cloud in the broad sweeping sky, was glancing down on Adesonia's troops <clears throat> in camp, and calls to Ulysses, flushed with triumph now. Bravo, my boy, bravo, your newborn courage. That's the path to the stars, son of the gods. You'll father gods to come. All fated wars to come will end in peace. Justly, under Asarachus's future sons, Troy can never hold you. <clears throat> in the same breath, the god Apollo dies from the vaulting skies, and cleaving the gusty wind, search for Ascanius. Searches for Ascanius. <clears throat> he assumes the form and features of old Brutes, armor bearer once to Dardan and Chises, trusty guard of his gates, until Aeneas made him Ascanius' aid. So Apollo approached like Brutes, head to foot. The man's age, his voice, the shade of his skin, white hair, weapons clanging, clanging grimly, and counsels Eulus now in his full glow of triumph. Son of Aeneas, stop! Enough that Numinus fell to your flying shafts, and you have not paid a price. Apollo has granted this, your first flush of glory. He never envied your arrows, a match for the archer's own. For the battles to come, hold back for now, dear boy. This order is still on his lips. Apollo vanished from sight into empty air. But the Trojan captains recognized the god, his immortal arms, and heard his arrows rustling in his quiver as he flew. So they restrained Ascanius, blazing for battle, pressing on him Apollo's will and last commands. 
but they themselves go rushing back to fight and expose their lives to peril. Cries rock the ramparts, up and down the walls, their tensing murderous blows, whipping spear straps, weapons strewing the ground, shields and hollow helmets ringing out under impact, fighting surges, raging strong as a tempest out the west when the kids are when the kids are rising great with rain that lashes the earth and thick and fast as the hail that storm clouds shower, pelting headlong down on the waves when Jupiter, fierce with south wind, spins a whirlwind, thunderheads exploding down the sky. Pandarus and Bidias, Alcanor of Ida's offspring born by the nymph Yera, once in Jupiter's grove, men like pines and peaks on the, of their native land, who trusted so to their swords. They fling wide the gate, their gate, their captain entrusted to them, all on their own, inviting enemy ranks to breach the walls. There they loom in the gateway, left and right like towers, armed in iron, crests on their high heads flaring, tall as a pair of oaks along a stream in spate, by the Po's banks or the adages lovely waters, rearing their uncropped heads to the high sky, their twin crowns waving tall. <clears throat> but in they charge, the Rutulian forces seeing the way wide open now. In an instant, Quirkins, Aquiluses striking in armor, Tamaris, daredevil heart, and Haman, son of Mars, with all their squadrons rooted, turn tail and run or throw their lives down right at the gateway's mouth. And the more they fight, the hotter, the, the hotter their battle fury grows, and now the Trojans mass, regrouping to storm the site clashing man to man, daring to foray further out. Turnus, the great captain, is blazing on in another zone, stampeding the Trojan ranks so when the news arrives. The enemy, flushed with the latest, car latest carnage, offers their gates flung open now. And Turnus wheels, dropping the task at hand, and full of fury, speeds to the Trojan gate to face the headstrong brothers. But first, Antiphides, he was the first to charge, Sarpedon's bastard son by a mother born in Thebes. But Turnus cuts him down. His Italian cardinal spear shaft wings through the melting air and piercing the man's stomach thrusts up into his chest and froth from the wound's black pit comes bubbling up as the steel heats in the lung it struck. Then Merops and Erymas die at his hands. Then Aphidnus, even Bidias, eyes ablaze, all rage at heart. And not by a spear, he'd never give up his life to a spear. A massive pike with a giant blade comes hurtling, roaring into him, dry, driven home like a lightning bolt. And neither the two bull's hides of his shield, nor trusty breastplate, double mailed with its scales of gold, can block its force. His immense limbs collapse, and earth groans as his giant shield thunders down on his body. Huge as a masoned pier that falls at, a, at times on the shore of Euboan Bay. First, they build it of massive blocks, then send it crashing over, dragging all in its wake. And it crushes down on the ocean floor as the waves roil and black sand goes heaving into the air. And Prokaida Island quakes to its depths and the craggy bed of Inaramine. In Arim, weighted Typhus down by Jove's command. Here, Mars, power of war, injects new heart and force in the Latins, twisting his sharp spurs in their chest and loosing flight and dark fear at the Trojan ranks. And the Latins swarm in from all directions, seize the moment for all out assault as the war god strikes their spirit. <clears throat> Pandarus, Seeing his brother's body spread on the ground and sensing how fortune falls, disaster rules the day. With all his might, he rams his massive shoulder into the gate and wheels it shut on its hinges, shuts out many comrades now outside the ramparts, facing an uphill battle, and shuts in many others, ushering fighters home as in they rush, along with himself, the crazy fool, not to have spotted Turnus charging in with the crowds. And all unwittingly, shut him up inside the walls like a claw-mad tiger among some helpless flock. Suddenly, strange light flares from Turnus's eyes and his armor clangs. Horrific, the blood-red plumes shake on his head 
and the shield shoots bolts of lightning. They know him at once, his hated face, his immense frame, and Aeneas's troops are stunned. But enormous Pandarus breaks, breaks ranks, a fire with rage at his brother's death, and shouts, No palace here, your dowry, dowry from Amata. Look, no fortress Ardea hugging her native Turnus. What you see is your enemy's camp. You can't escape. And Turnus replied with a cool, collected smile, On with it now. If you have the backbone in you, let's trade blows. You'll tell the ghost of Priam you found an Achilles, even here. No more talk. Putting all his strength behind him, Pandarus hurls his spear, unpolished, knotted, bark still rough, but the breeze whisk it away. Saturnian Juno flicks aside the approaching wound, and the weapon stabs the gate. But you won't escape my blade whirling in my right hand, cries Turnus. No, this sword and the man who wields it, the wounds they deal are fatal. Rearing to full height, sword high, the steel hacks the brows, splitting the temples, gruesome wound, and it cleaves the soft, unshaken cheeks. A great crash. Under his huge weight, the earth quakes, his limbs fall limp, his armor splattered with brains. He sprawls on the ground in death, in perfect halves, over both his shoulders, right and left. His head goes lolling free. The Trojans swerve and scatter in panic, and if the conquering hero had thought at once of smashing the gate bolts, letting his cohorts in, this day would have been the last day of the war, the last of the Trojans, too. But Turnus's hot fury, his mad lust for carnage, drives him against his foes. First he seizes Phalaris, cuts the knees from under Gyges, snatching their spears, he whips them into the backs of men who break and run as Juno builds his courage, his war lust. Hallus next, he sends him packing along with comrades, Phegeus too, as a spear impales through him through his shield. Then men on the ramparts, keen for combat, blind to Turnus who picks them off, Alexander and Hallius, Prytanus and Noman. Lincius swings to attack, shouting his comrades on, but first from the right hand rampart, Turnus spins with one stroke of his dazzling sword, close up. That brings down Lincius, slashes his head off, head and helmet tumbling far away. Next he brings down Amicus, gifted killer of wild game, no hand more skilled at dipping an arrow's point or capping a lance with poison, then Clidius, Aeolus' son, then Cretheus, friend of the Muses, the Muses' comrade, Cretheus, always dear to his heart the song and lyre, turning a verse to the taut string, always singing of cavalry, weapons, wars, and the men who fight them. At last, the Trojan captain hear of the massacre of their troops. Menestheus, fierce Serestus, both come rushing in and seeing their ranks in panic, ranks of enemy lodged inside the gates. Menestheus shouts, shouts out, Where are you heading? Where are you flying now? What other walls, what other ramparts have you got? My countrymen, can one man pinned up in your fortress on all sides spread such slaughter through the city? Send such a rout of first-rate fighters down to death and never pay the price? You feckless, craven, have you no pity? <laughs> craven, whoops. <laughs> have you no pity? No shame for your wretched land, you, your gods of old, for great Aeneas? That ignites them, stiffens their spine, and in closing ranks they halt as Turnus pulls back from the melee, heading step by step from the banks where the river rings the camp. All the more fiercely Trojans swarm him, war cries breaking, ranks packed tight as a band of huntsmen bristling spears attacking a savage lion. Terrified, true, but glaring still, ferocious still as he backs away, but his heart his fury keep him from turning tail. Yet for all his wild desire, he still can't claw his way through spears and huntsmen. Just so torn, so slowly, but surely, Turnus backs away, his spirit churning with anger. Twice he charged the thick of his foes, twice he broke their lines, stampeding the Trojans down their walls at speed. But a whole battalion marching out of the camp comes massing hard against him, not even Juno dares reinforce his power to counterattack. No, 
Jove sped Iris down from the high heavens, winging strict commands for his sister, Juno, if Tronus did not quit the lo Trojans' looming walls. So now, no shield, no sword arm helps the fighter stand up under the onslaught, overpowering salvos battering down on him left and right. Over and over, the helmet casing his hollow temples rings out shrill. The solid bronze of it splits wide open under the rocks. The plumes are ripped from his head. The boss of his shield caves in to the hammering blows. And the Trojan ranks, with lightning bolt Menestheus out in the lead, unleash an immense barrage of spears, and sweat goes rippling over Turnus's entire body, rivering down, black with filth, can't catch his breath, gasping, weak knees quaking, bone tired until at last he dives head first, plunging into the river, armor and all, and Tiber swept him into its yellow tide, catching him as he came, then bore him up in its soothing waves and bathing away to the carnage, gave the elated fighter back to friends.